Joshua. There's a test subject. Here's a test subject. You want to come up and do a test subject, Josh? Not right now. I will come get you. What's your friend's name? Joe. Joe would like to do it, right, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This is called Who's Sitting on God? And um, in order to kind of understand it, you, ha you have to understand that it's just like Beauty and the Beast. These are not real people that we're talking about. These are thought patterns, conflicts that go on inside of the mind, ideas, uh, egos, tempers, personalities, and they're all described in various ways in the Bible. So it provides a tremendous outlet for us once we understand and break the code to be able to realize what is written thousands of years ago concerning our uh, operation as human beings and how we live. Well, if you remember last week, Jacob, who is this child of promise, and he was working. His father is Laban, okay? So Jacob becomes the, the ego, the personality. Laban is the father, which is the mind, all right? And a deal was struck last week that Jacob said, look, of all the cattle here, here's what I want, you know, and I want Rachel's for my wife and Lisa, but I'll take all the cattle that are spotted, and you have all the ones that are pure. So right away we get the aspect that, okay, Laban represents that which is the divine mind, and Jacob that which is the lower. These are all the thoughts that drive us crazy. And, you know, young kids get them just as well as old people do. And, and, and the other things that scare you, you know, they scare you. And it's not a scary movie. It's something that scares you when you're lying in bed and you're thinking or you're, you're at school or wherever you are. It's frightening. So Jacob says, I'll take all of these. Well, the next day last week, Laban went through all of the cattle and sent all of the spotted ones away. So there was none, because what it says is, basically, the divine or the higher mind does not want us to have spotted cattle. It doesn't want us to have those thoughts that are scary and frightening and make us sick. But Jacob wanted them. So, of course, a very occult and mystical part of the story was that Jacob took these things and put them in front of the cattle. And so when the cattle then had uh, relation, you know, they had babies, uh, the, 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 the cattle came out spotted. Well, of course, that's silly. What it's trying to say is what you put before yourself, what you start and you concentrate on, can become real. That's what, that's what the idea here was. So anyhow, what he did, Laban was away, and Jacob took all of his spotted cattle, because he took all of the strong ones. In other words, the, the personality aspects of, of our mind are, are very strong and combative and, 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 and kind of difficult. That's what we look for. We look for combat and competition. And he ran off with all of this stuff, and then the father mind Laban starts chasing after him. And that's where the story gets to at this time. Say. So if you want to try to just understand, because it's, it's, it's important to try to put it into perspective as to what this story about, the spotted cattle okay, are your lower thoughts and the thoughts that are negative thoughts, and they're yours. They're the thoughts that hurt you and cause you a lot of problems. And of course, the pure ones are those part of the right side, which are God. And if you look on page 958 of those little Bibles, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, that God is looking for a church not having spot. Okay? So wherever we run into in this story, these things that are spotted, especially cattle, spotted cattle, are thoughts that are our own making and, and generally cause us a lot of problems, a lot of difficulty. Okay, so here we have this conflict going on, and the conflict going on right now is Jacob and Laban, but these people don't even exist, never did. This is talking about you. These are two parts, this is a conflict which is going on inside of your mind, and some of you are having a conflict going on right inside of your mind as you're sitting here right now, you know, and it never stops, it always goes on, and the Bible and all of the ancient books are perfect examples. The Bhagavad Gita of Hare Krishna is the conflict between the left side and the right side. Here you had Adam and Eve, and who'd they have a conflict with? They had a conflict with God. They had a conflict with the snake. And then you had Cain and Abel who had a conflict. And you got Jacob and Esau had a conflict. And Jacob and Laban have a conflict. And, and Samson had a conflict with Delilah. And Jesus had a conflict with organized religion. And it never ends. There's always a conflict that goes on. And each one of us, that, you know, we're part of this. It's a struggle between the lower, and it's a struggle between the lower and the higher. See, so here's a situation where Jacob now represents that part of you that's in between Esau, which is a, a, a brother, a part of the mind, a thought pattern that he's afraid of. Here's Jacob in the middle of it, and now he's got this guy Laban, which is part of the mind. So he's in the middle of this. He's in the middle of this struggle. From both ends, it's coming at him. 
It seems to be maybe a spiritual side coming at him, but also that which is the fleshly carnal side coming at him. And, and you're caught right in the middle of this kind of struggle. Okay. Right in the middle of it. So let's, uh, let's pick this up here. Remember now, Jacob has run off with all the spotted cattle, and he made the spotted cattle strong, and he made the, the pure cattle weak. In other words, we are in charge of our own thing. We are creating our own combat. We are creating our own competition, and we are creating our own problems, and we're running off, and we're going to try to get as far away from this thing, as far away from the spiritual thing as we can. And actually, what we're doing is we're running away from the spiritual thing, Lob, and we're running back into the direction of this, which is the brother that's out to kill us, Esau. And yet we think we're doing the right thing because we've created this mess. See? <coughs> See? Oh, this must be right because this, you know, what else can I do? I mean, we're all alone. There's nobody to advise you. There's nobody to tell you what to do. So you think, you think and you say, but watch the wisdom that comes out of this. On page 26 of those little Bibles, in Genesis chapter 31, here's Jacob racing away. And it says... In uh, uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 2, it says, uh, And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and it was not towards him as it was before. So here then, this is your ego, and you're really having a problem with your spiritual side. Some of you, some of you really don't even have a spiritual side. Don't even really know what it is. As far as you know, well, it's always been religion. But here you're having a problem with this. You're having a problem with yourself, which is Esau. So really, you're in the middle of a, of a mess, and you're not, you're not getting anywhere with anything. There's just a, a lot of conflict going on inside of your head. And, and it happens, and it happens to everybody, and it, and it is happening to everybody. So here's the instruction that comes from quote-unquote God. Verse 3 of Genesis 26, uh, G Genesis 31 on page 26, verse 3. The Lord said to Jacob, return unto the land of your father and to your kindred, and I will be with you. His instructions to say, hey... Go back here, and I'll be with you. Return to the place where all of this started. And this is where all of the problems started that you started, and this is what? This is your own ego. So who is telling you this? It says in the Bible that God said that, but keep that in mind. Keep in mind this instruction and where it originated from, even though it says the Lord said, go back. So here's the point where you had an opportunity, you prospered when you were serving this side, which is the spiritual side, but you decided that you wanted too much for yourself, you wanted to be on your own, so you took this which was symbolized as the spotted stuff, and now you're taking that, the wives, and everything that you made here, and you're running away from this side, which is the right side, and you're running smack back to this side, which is the left side, back to the carnal mind, back to the conflict. Okay, so what all of this simply means, and just think about yourself. Maybe you want to close your eyes for a minute. You don't have to, but just think within yourself. What all of this is saying is that inside of you, there is a deep emotional conflict going on. And you know what? Most of us would be hard-pressed to say in one way or another, that's not true, because it is. And all of this is simply a storytelling way of describing how very active stress pulls us in all different directions. It just pulls us in all different directions, and it doesn't make any difference. We don't know how to deal with it. It doesn't make any difference if you're 14 years old or 16 years old or if you're 80 years old. It makes no difference. You have a private thing going on inside of here. And your closest friends, your mother or father, your family, nobody knows. It's happening in here. And it is a drama, and it is a drama that's being spelled out in this allegorical, mythological story of stress and combat, competition and running and trying to find something that we don't even know what it is. And what is the first reaction of all of this? Here is Jacob who messed around and deceived his father, ran away from his brother, got together with this Laban, messed up him, and now is running across on his own. And what is our first reaction? This is our first reaction. It's on page 26. Whenever we create this mess, the first reaction that we have to any question about it is in Genesis chapter 31, verse 7, your father deceived me. He did it, not me. I had nothing to do with this. I didn't screw this up. He did it. She did it. Say. You know, remember, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, on page 3 in the Bible, and here's the story of Adam and Eve. And what was the first thing when God says, hey, Adam, you really screwed this up? What did Adam turn around and say? He was a man from Mars, okay? And Adam turned around, and the man from Mars said, the woman did it. She did it. She did it. She did it. She did it. 
It wasn't me. It wasn't us guys. We don't do stuff like that. Say, couldn't have been me. Say, so always it's the same thing. And what this is saying is that's the way it is. You're never going to be able to accept the fact that maybe, just maybe, the mess you're in may have something to do with yourself. And religion comes along and they don't want you to have to deal with that because you may just be able to straighten yourself out. And so what they say is, oh, don't worry about it. Just sit in the slop and stir the slop and a heavenly creator will come out on a white horse and save you from all of this. You have nothing to do. It's not your responsibility. Somebody else is going to save you. And basically that's what people do. They go to church because they're in a mess. And you know what? When they're going to church, somebody tells them there's a savior coming. He's going to save you. And they love it because inside of them they know they need something because there's absolute chaos in here. And the guy that's in church that's up in the pulpit has ten times more chaos going on in here than the people that are sitting out there that he's going to save. Totally screwed up. And he, the reason it's diff more difficult for him is he's trying to convey that he's pure. Look at me. <laughs> Look at I have, we, I have stained glass, I have robes, and we sing songs. Aren't I something? He's a mess. This guy's a mess. But see, he, he can't let anybody, you see, you can go and if anybody catches you, well, you know, you sometimes, the flesh, but he can't, see. But everybody's the same and everybody has the same conflict going on within ourselves. And then what we do, we start to construct a story to, after we've blamed everybody else for our mess, we start to construct a story. Look at page 26, Genesis 31, page uh, uh, 8. And look, he said, the speckled, the spotted cattle are going to be yours, then all the cattle that were speckled, and he said this, and the ring straight, and all the, and then God taken away. Then God took away the cattle of your father, and he gave them to me. See, he cheated. And what he's saying is, look, don't blame me for screwing it up. He, God did that to him. It was me. God struck him because he was evil. I won't admit that I did it, and I did. And now this other poor guy's in a mess, and I won't admit that I contributed to him. God did that to him for, 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 for being faithful. I thought of some weird, bizarre type of thing to explain. So, the very turmoil continues. We are a child of promise, but we are also open to these thoughts that generate deep conflict, and also what's generated within us in this deep conflict are alibis. We always have to have an alibi. I do it all the time. If you know you've screwed something up, the first thing you do is retreat to your cave and think up a way out. <laughs> That's right. How am I going to get out of this? And you know what's the great thing for me standing up here? I see all of you grin. <laughs> see, oh, there's an alibi in every one of you. Because we know you're guilty. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Now, I want you to remember something. And this is, the, this is the beautiful part of this. Before Abraham could be set free, he had to become Abraham. Okay? Before Jacob can be set free, he has to become Israel. Okay? Before you can be set free, you have to become I am. There has to be a change. And the change can't be from school, it cannot be from your parents, it cannot be from the government, it cannot be from the authorities, it has to come from within you. It is a very private, beautiful, personal, intimate change. And it happens in the operation of your mind. And you have to be willing to submit your mind to a higher thing. Um, Dave Sibilia I was over the house the other night, we were just sitting talking and we are watching the TV about crop circles. I'm going to bring it in one day to you. But this man, who was a very brilliant scientist, was showing these crop circles. And they're asking him, oh, you know, I mean, these, these, these things carved in the wheat were so magnificent, so beautiful, so ge uh, geometrically perfect in, in their design. And, and, and they're saying, who, who could do anything like this? And this scientist stood there and very sheepishly grinned, and he said, I think we're hearing from the management. <laughs> the only, that's the only explanation, so. What means that the management is waiting for you to submit yourself to a, to a sort of crop circle in here. A statement is being made. See? So before fulfillment comes, there has to be a change. And this energy is that energy that we talk through at meditation that comes up these seven chakras. And so here's where, where, where Jacob is running away. 
and yet we're all running away. And the reason that you're sitting here listening to me, and I'll tell you something, there's a lot of people that are frightened of me. Okay? And they're frightened of me, just like that lady was frightened of me that turns me off. Not because what I'm saying is evil, but because what I'm saying requires a responsibility on their part and interferes with their traditional myth that they can just fly away and do what they, what they want to do and some guy's going to come on a white horse. It's very, it's very frightening to people to finally realize, hey, you have a responsibility for some of the things that go on in your life and some of the problems that you have. Now, here's the interesting part, okay? Here you are. You've gotten this mess that you've created. You've gotten all of this stuff going south in your life, and yet you're trying to justify it. Remember, already you've justified by saying, now look, it's his fault or it's her fault. And then you alibied it if this had happened, and if so-and-so, and all of these alibis that you concocted, okay? Because you took all of the spotted stuff, and the spotted are thoughts, spotted cattle, are thoughts that are of the lower mind, all right? Now we're going to run into another animal here, which is called the ram. And the ram is a divine thought, spiritual thought, okay? When you get a spiritual thought, generally you may think, well, that's from God. But you know what? In religion, you create a lot of these. And you think, and it's part of the alibi. You, get, you can read something in the Bible, or you can hear something in the church, or you can see something from a TV preacher, and it gives you an opportunity to justify the disaster that you've created. Okay? And here isn't something beautiful that happens here. Now remember, a ram is a divine thought. When the ram mixes with your cattle, generally that's a divine impulse that's going to help you solve the problems of the negative thoughts in your mind. The ram mixes with the cattle. That's an ancient Eastern mystical philosophy that, hey, the divine aspect is going to move in and help you with the spotted cattle, help you with the thoughts that are causing you problems. I want you to look very carefully. There's a very occult message here, a very a deep message, and see if you can pick it up, because here it's kind of a, a finger pointing at Jacob, a finger pointing at you and me when we create religious alibis. Okay? Go to page 26 and look at Genesis chapter 31, verse 12. And here is an angel that speaks. This is an inner impulse that speaks to Jacob. And he says, hey, Jake, verse 12, lift up your eyes and look at all the rams which leaped upon the cattle. They're spotted. They're spotted. Because I've seen everything Laban's done. All of these things that you thought were from God are from you. Say, this was part of your religion. It's part of your spirituality. Oh, I read this. I prayed this. I meditated this. You created all of it. You created the mess, and then you created that which is going to take you out of the mess. And you're deeper than you ever were. It's just like what we do in politics. We elect politicians that create the mess. We elect other politicians to get us out of the mess. And then when they get us out of the mess, we elect other politicians to get us back into the mess. It's all part of spotted cattle. And now we find out that not only were the, spot, the cattle spotted, which is our thoughts, but the ram is spotted, which are supposedly God's thoughts. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. It's like in Jeremiah, would say the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear witness by whether, and what will you do in the end? And you can sit here, and some of you can get very bored about this, but you got a life, you know, and your life can be one extension of hell. And there's no hell that exists anywhere but in your head, but in your head can exist hell. And it can burn and burn and burn until you die but you can extinguish it. And you don't have to prove anything to me because you don't have to come to this church. And you don't have to prove anything to me because you don't have to come to meditation. You don't have to prove anything to me because you don't have to give any money to me. But you have to prove something to only one person, yourself. You have to be true to you. And you have to start learning. You take care of your eyes. If you can't see right, right away you run to the doctor. If your stomach doesn't feel right, you run and you take some medicine. And you don't realize that your mind isn't feeling right. And your mind is just an integral part of your body as every other thing, and you better start taking care of it. And you have to allow some time for meditation. That's the only way. So here, then, we find that the truth is that what we thought was God was our own creation. And now we get to the point on page 27 in Genesis chapter 31 and verse 
17, okay? Genesis chapter 31 and verse 17, it says, Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. You know what that means? Here's the part where you're starting to realize, I'm in a mess. And religion hasn't helped me. Nothing has helped me. Family hasn't helped me. Work hasn't helped me. Job hasn't helped me. Education hasn't helped me. Religion hasn't helped me, and I'm all by myself. So it says he raises up his wives, which are the spiritual parts of him, and he raises up everything he has, and he places them on camels. Now, they always have camels. And you know why camels are so important mystically? Because they live on inner water. They take water within, and they can go long distances across the barren desert without refilling. You know, they can live off of that water that's what's in themselves and carry those things across the dark, high, barren desert. Say. So all of this stuff he starts taking, and it says in verse 18, and he carried away all his cattle and all his goods and all the thing that he has gotten, and he's going back to the Father. So now the story starts changing a little bit. We're starting to see something here. We're starting to see the fact that, okay, you know, all of this thing I've done by deception, all of this thing really that I've screwed up, but now I've got to get back. In this particular matter, it's the Father, if you want to call it God, if you want to call it the right side of the brain, if you want to call it that inner divine presence. We've got to get back there. So just picture this in your mind. It's just like one of those movies. This whole caravan starts out across the desert, but actually what it is are a caravan of thoughts within your head trying to find that place with inside of you where this father or where this mother exists where something inside of you can finally open a way for you out of the problems that you have created and we set ourselves back returning to the father and it says on page 27 on Genesis chapter 20 and Jacob stole away unawares to Laban into the into that he told him not that he fled in other words we steal away unawares there's no communication with the mind we're now starting to move into a meditation there's no need for you to explain to yourself there's no need for you to explain to me there's no need for you to explain to a church but you've got to move away you've got to steal away you've got to come into the darkness of that inner self and you've got to find that quiet time away. Shut the door. Shut the door on everybody. Close the door. For a time you have to be alone. For a time you have to be by yourself. For a time then you energize that all by yourself and you steal away and you start heading across the desert of the mind to try to find that which is the Father. And it says in verse 21, look what it says here, he fled with all that he had. Everything that you have is right here. The enemies that you have are right here. The only enemies you have in the world are in your head. And everything that you have is in here. You can make a kingdom, you can make a magnificent, beautiful thing. If you'll, if you'll learn from within yourself, you start to harmonize with nature, you'll start to harmonize with people, you'll start to harmonize with animals, and it's co totally contrary to the way they live out there. Because the, the religious people out there, all they do is read a book. Everything is in a book. They don't know about hugging a tree. They don't know about hugging a pussycat. They don't know that hugging a pussycat puts you closer to God than all the Bibles in the world. They don't know that. And the reason they don't know that is because their television set in here only goes up to 13 and God transmits on 9,000. How are you going to get to channel 9,000? You've got to plug into a cosmic cable. You've got to lift that energy. The most high God is the most high frequency and you've got to raise the frequency of your mind. And when you raise the frequency of your mind, you will touch that thing that you've heard of called God and you'll find it's inside of you. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to realize that. So everything he's got, he's fleeing with all of his thoughts and he sets his face, it says, towards Mount Gilead. Do you know what it means? It means the hill of testimony. Do you know what it means? It means the high place, however you spell it, it means the high place inside of your mind where you will be able to speak within yourself and you will be able to listen within yourself. And that's where you're going now because everything is falling apart. And now look, we start to introduce the numerology, the Pythagorean numerology in the Bible. Number three means a change is going to happen. Number three means there's something new going to happen. Number three means it's not going to be the way it was before. And you know why that is? Because three days and three nights of the winter solstice, three days and three nights on December the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun sits in the bowels of the earth. The days are the darkest they've ever been. But on December the 25th, the sun by the trajectory of the earth moves upward, and it means something new is going to happen. Every day is going to be a little bit lighter. And voila, when the sun touches the Lamb of Aries, spring is going to come. 
So three always is a number that means something new is going to happen. And in Genesis 31, verse 22, and it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob had fled. See? Jacob had fled. So we see the meditation will evolve. And now you have the number seven, which is the seven chakras, those mystical elements that run up the spine, which are in the Bible in Revelation 10. And it says in Genesis chapter 31, verse 23, and he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days. And they overtook him in Mount Gilead at the Hill of Testimony. So here we have the confrontation in the mind. We've had the mystical numbers, and now we have the confrontation on the hill in the higher part of your mind between Jacob, that which is the uh, ego aspect, and Laban, that which is the father aspect and, uh, of the mind. And here we have this confrontation. This is a very interesting statement. Now, watch this statement very carefully. How did Adam and Eve get in trouble, according to the Bible? They took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See? You can't eat from that tree because things that you think are good can be really screwed up. And things that you think of evil can really save your life. So you don't know. There's no way of knowing. That's why you've got to go to the tree of life, which is in the right hemisphere of the brain, and you have to touch that through the meditation. Okay, so I want you to look at the knowledge of the tree of, the good, of good and evil in this statement. God speaks to Laban, the father image here, and he says, Laban, Genesis chapter 31, 24. He comes to Laban in a dream by night, and he says, Take heed that you do not speak to Jacob either good or bad. You see it? Do you see it? Don't speak. Say, what, what's being said there? You, you, you. You do not try to get out of your problems by taking from the tree of good and evil. Don't try to take the thoughts that come to you from the left side to solve your problem. He didn't say, go tell him how wonderful he is. Oh, don't go tell him how spiritual he is. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. And how do you refrain from taking from the tree of good and evil? How do you refrain from not saying anything good not saying anything bad. How is it possible? It's very possible. Page 782. Matthew chapter 6. And what does Jesus say? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, take no Don't take any thoughts that are good. Don't take any thoughts that are bad. Take none of them, because they'll only deceive you. But you've got to rise above them. You've got to rise above the thoughts. See? The problem can only be resolved away from this tree. The problem can only be resolved. So here we are in Genesis chapter 31 on page 27. We're just about wrapping this up. Genesis chapter 31. In verse 25, it says, Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain, and Laban pitched in the Mount of Gilead. So here's the confrontation. But remember, you're not going to hear anything from the mind. The confrontation in the mind. This is what you, when you come in here and you're into meditation, you're on Mount Gilead, and you're not going to be confronted either good or evil. You're not going to hear anything. And that's what this is all about. So the confrontation takes place. And now here's the point. When you go in, and when you really struggle with this and you come into a meditation, the mind is going to start saying something. It's not, and look what it says. In Genesis chapter 31, verse 25, 26, Jake says, what have you done? You, 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 why have you stolen away unaware? You carried away my daughters and why would you flee away? And, and, you, and you know what the whole thing is? Your mind is saying to you, why me? Why me? What a mess. Of all the people that it could happen to, why did it have to happen to me? I never did nothing. I never even got a speeding ticket. Look what happened to me. Look at this. It's screwed up and look at me. And I pay my taxes and I go to church and everything. And look at this. The IRS is coming. Why me? Alice. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So we go into the why me mode as we're about to launch into this great mystical cleansing. See, and then we say here in Genesis chapter 31, 27, if you had only done this, if I had only done that, if you had only said this, then this wouldn't have come out this way. Yes, it would have. Yes, it would have. <laughs> hmm. 
Now it says in Genesis 31, 30, Laban saying, you want to go back to your father. You want to go back to meditate. You, see, the mind is saying, now watch, Laban has taken the, watch me, Laban has taken the place of the mind. And the mind is saying to you, you want to go back to the Father. In other words, you want to go back to the higher part of the mind. Then I've got a question to ask you. Watch this one real carefully, because this we're getting to the point. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, okay, you took everything. You don't want to be around here anymore. Your mind is talking to you. You're a Catholic. You're a Baptist. You're a Methodist. You're a Presbyterian, whatever you are. And you know what your mind says now? Tell me something. Why have you taken my gods? You know, here you're sitting with Crazy Billy in the meditation place, and what happened to your Methodist heritage and your Presbyterian heritage and your Baptist heritage? Who's taking your gods? All of the things you were raised with. Why? And your mind says to you, you're down there listening to that crazy music. You're hearing squawking coming out of there and gongs banging. Why are you giving up your Christian heritage? Why are you giving up your walk with God? <laughs> Jesus. Why have you stolen my God? And your mind is asking you, you don't have your religion anymore. You've stolen your God, see? You're going back to the fire. So, you've taken the religion away. Now watch what happens in Genesis chapter 31 and verse 32. And Jacob says, look. Whoever you find that has stolen your God, you should kill him. But Jacob didn't know in the story that the one who had stolen the gods was his beloved wife who gave birth to Joseph of the coat of many colors, Rachel. So Laban said, okay. He draws his sword and says, okay, I will go into the tent, and whoever I find that has stolen these gods, I'll kill him. Jacob says, go to it. Laban in Genesis 31, 33 searches the tent. The mind is seeking the truth. The mind is trying to find its traditional roots. And when you come in here, many times you try to find your conditional roots. And many, uh, traditional roots, and many times I see the chairs. And I see that you've come in here, and then I see that it's too much, it's too strong. You long for your gods, and so the chair is empty. You've gone back, you've found your gods. It's okay. See? And then he goes into Rachel's tent. Genesis 31, 33, he goes into Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel was the emotions who has been lifted to the point of spirit. Rachel is your spirit. Don't you see? She gave birth to Joseph with a coat of many colors. Joseph, electric dream color. She, your spirit, your feminine spirit, is hiding those evil gods from the mind. She has taken them, and she is hiding them. And watch how the story allegorically portrays this. Genesis 31, verse 34 says, she put them in the camel's furniture and sat on them. Oh, wow. She put them in the camel's furniture, which is the camel which lives, remember, that can go great distances across the barren waste, which thrives off that inner water that accumulates within it. The spirit hides the old religious thoughts that used to drive you into guilt and into fear and all of this expectation of things that are nothing more than pure paganism and she hides them so that they can't bother you anymore. And so she's sitting on them. See the ladies, Rachel. You don't want to be Rachel. You want to be Rachel. <laughs> Josh. Joe. Okay, I don't have any Rachels. No, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> She's sitting on the gods, but now he comes in with his sword. Generally, the father comes in, you would rise to meet him. Get up. She can't get up because she's sitting. But look what she says in Genesis 31, 35. She says, oh, father, 
Let it not displease you that I cannot rise before you, for the custom of women is upon me. I have my period, Father. <laughs> I'll have to sit here. I can't get up. I guess they didn't have the things that they have now. So don't mind if I sit here, Dad. Oh, yes, Rachel. It's that time of month. I, I don't want to disturb you. So stay sitting. Okay? But I mean, this is, this is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. I mean, this is great teaching. Last week, the guy cheering, he put stuff in front of the cow, so when they had sex, the cows had spots on them. This week, his wife is sitting on God with her period. He gets in. And, and I'll tell you something. They, the, the, our friends down the street take this stuff literally. Can you see God on that cushion? Jesus, I don't know. That's what he would be saying to Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I should have figured another way to make this happen. Okay, let's get serious. Just for a second, as I'm wrapping it up, we're done, okay? Listen to me. Listen to me. Watch real carefully. The woman is the spirit, okay? The blood is the power, the inner power of the spirit. And the power of the spirit now is flowing. And the old ways are covered by the blood. The old ways are covered over by the blood to make preparation for a new life because when the blood flows, it cleanses and ovulates and makes way for a new life. The blood is flowing from the Spirit, preparing for a new life and covering over by the power of that blood all of the old thoughts that hurt and brought guilt and fear and set you away from God. And she will not move. She will not move. And in Genesis 31, verses 37 to 43, the storyline goes that the struggle between Jacob and Laban starts to get up to the point of the hill of testimony, and, a, and, a, and an accord is made. A higher meditation is made. It says in Genesis 31, 54, they stayed all night. That means they had meditation in the higher mind. And then they parted. Jacob and Laban parted. Jacob parted from the mind. Finally, he was free from the mind. And now he could start this inner conflict, this inner struggle. Finally, you're free from the mind. You've made this in your meditation. That's the first point. You've separated from the thoughts of the mind. Now you can go back to the Father's house. Now you can have a realization within you. It says they parted. And as next week we come to this point, you're going to find what I think is the most fantastic scripture in all of the Bible. Jacob finally is free of that which is the mind. And he sends everything that he owns to the other side. And next week he discovers something within him that changes him forever. And it's called Peniel. Okay. We'll see you. John will be on and